This is a factorial. I'm pretty sure you know it. Because you clicked this video, I assume you know the gamma function. This is how most of us learned gamma function. We first write it as an integral. We do integration by parts. Then we find a nice recursive relationship. Then we have the conclusion that the gamma function is a natural extension of the factorial for non-integers. It works for all real numbers, except the negative integers. Very exciting, because we can do fancy stuff like gamma 1, which is 0 factorial, and we can prove that it is in fact 1. I mean, this is good, but did we ever learn where the gamma function comes from? Let's say we have x, an integer, for now. x factorial has this expression. I can find another n, an integer, and write x factorial like this. The numerator can be rearranged, so we have n factorial times n plus 1 up to n plus x. So far, we are only playing the game of expressions. Now, I multiply both the numerator and denominator by n to the power of x. I can rearrange the terms to move the highlighted part together, so we write x factorial as a product of two fractions. Now it's time to send n to infinity. There isn't much we can say about the first fraction, but for the second fraction, when x is finite, as always, the second fraction goes to 1, because n plus 1 over n, n plus 2 over n, up to n plus x over n, when n goes to infinity, is just 1. And we arrived at the Euler's product formula for the gamma function. Euler derived this formula about 300 years ago in a letter to Goldbach. It is crystal clear that because n goes to infinity, all negative integers are out of the domain. The beauty of this formula is that x doesn't have to be an integer anymore. It can be a fraction, like one half. 300 years ago, Euler knows that the factorial of one half is the square root of pi over 2, but that's for the next time. This idea of continuation of some operations on integers only to non integers is everywhere. You may not even realize that. The common trick is that once you have the final result, you discard the assumptions. Next, we convert our product formula to an integral. This is our goal. For any n, we prove that this equation holds true. Let's do a u substitution with s equals t over n. This way, the integral upper bound becomes 1, and we can move n to the power of x out of the integral sign. With a little bit of manipulation, we can cancel out this n to the power of x on both sides, and we end up with this integration. This integration has a name, the Euler's integral of the first kind, aka the beta function. I highly encourage you to pause the video and do the integral. If you say you love mathematics, you have to do it once in your life. Fantastic! We did it! Now let's send n to infinity. The left hand side we have x minus 1 factorial. On the right hand side we have this integral that n goes to infinity. And our ultimate goal is to prove that these two expressions are equivalent. Let's take the difference. Then the highlighted part must go to 0 fast enough such that the integration goes to 0. And indeed, this highlighted part is bounded nicely. Let's prove this. First, let's do some basic manipulations. Nothing too fancy here. Our goal is to prove that the last row is true. Let's focus on the left hand side. First, let's rewrite 1 as e to the power of t times e to the power of negative t. Now we need to prove that e to the power of negative t is always no less than its most common limit expression. Let's do a u substitution. 
Remember, the original integral upper bound is n, so x is in range 0 to 1. Is this true? Yes, it's true, but I will leave to you as exercise. Here's a realization. This concludes our first half of the proof. Now let's move on to the second half. It's a little bit trickier. First, identify this inequality. By replacing t squared over n squared as x, we have this expression. And I'm pretty sure you can figure out this one. Next, we can rewrite the 1 minus t squared over n squared as a product, our famous a squared minus b squared. Compare it with our highlighted part. Our goal becomes proving that e to the power of t is no less than its most famous limit expression. Let's do the substitution again. The idea is similar to our first half. I will leave it to you, but here is a variation. All right, remember where we started? We proved that this inequality is true. Now let's make use of it. We started by taking the difference between these two integrals. Part of the integrand is bounded by our inequalities. And when we send n to infinity, aha, both sides are zero. And this concludes our derivation of the gamma function from factorial, from scratch. There are still some questions left. Like, what is a beta function? And is gamma function unique? Is there a gamma function for complex number? My friend, that's for next time.